conference or seminar, whichever you want to call it. First of all, I'm Michael Corbett from BFI, chairing chair today on behalf of it, and this is for the housekeeping program first. Obviously, make sure all of your mobile phones are off. Please, that's off, not just switch to text. Um, exits are on that side. We have a tea break at 11 o'clock, or five, quarter past 11. Um, and the main, the main thing you need to know, and there will be light lunch at around 1 o'clock. Can you hear Alan? So, Okay. So, for the moment, I'll go straight in and hand you over to John Dolan, CEO of DFI, and no doubt he'll give you a more comprehensive introduction. Thank you, Chairman, <coughs> Chairman Michael. And um, I'm delighted to see so many people here today, and um, a number of people from the board of DFI. Um, I'm very pleased that uh, the chair of the Oireachtas Committee for Justice, Equality and Defence, uh, David Stanton, is here with us. I uh, won't go through any more names, but it is great to see so many people from across the organisations, people with disabilities, and many others that have a strong interest in this. And it's very reassuring to the likes of me and colleagues to see a room filled as this one is this morning, given that there are so many pressures on people day in, day out these days. It's a great tribute to you all, and it's a great encouragement to me and to others to see that, uh, that, 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 that there is a yen for um, this agenda. Um, when I go, I'll make a few general comments. I don't want to get we have better people to get into the, the boundaries of the, of the, of the convention and to excavate, excavate different elements of it. I'm just going back in a general sense. For, uh, after the Second World War, you had the Universal Declaration of Human Rights at the end of, 2000, uh, at the end of 1948. The impetus for that was that we cannot, as human beings, go back to the killing, the slaughtering, the attrition, the pain, the horror that we had inflicted <coughs> on ourselves. You had the United Nations killing the set up. You had the International Monetary Fund set up. And some people might be surprised to find that it was invented that far back, not just 2010 when they visited us. And, uh, and we're glad for their support, I suppose, too. We are, of course. Uh, and then in the 50s, the coal and steam agreements between France, Germany, the EU, all of that set up. They were powerful instruments and they were about making sure we don't go back to that kind of attrition. I think we're in a different place. Now, thankfully, we're not, uh, the world is in the grip of what's called an economic recession fairly huge problems about the inclusion of people with disabilities and support for them and their families right across the globe uh, way more clearly way more difficult the issues are in Ireland <coughs> so let's come on to 2006 two things happened that year <coughs> it was the year marked two things clearly uh, the UN Convention. Um, as it happened, um, Ireland was creating a new social and economic agreement for itself, um, a social partnership agreement of, uh, towards 2016, which actually put flesh on the structures of our disability strategy, which up to then was seen as sector plans and departments, multi-annual funding, and a number of pieces of important legislation. But in 2006, there was a vision set for that, which was that people would be, and it was implied in the earlier stuff too, 
but it was set out clearly there that people would be able to enjoy, if that's the word, participation in life. Because participation in life has its ups and downs, but it is a right and it's part of, I suppose, human dignity that people can participate, can be part of the ebb and flow and not just uh, happily or otherwise be service users and service recipients, but people who participate in families, in work, in social activity. It's interesting to reflect that um, the UN Convention bestows no new rights on people. So think about that. You go back to the Universal Declaration, which is actually talking about the dignity of human beings, all human beings. It took us, what, another 60 years to come to a point which in, a, in, in one reading of it is saying, we have made progress over that half century or more. In Ireland, in our own democracy since the 20s, we have made progress. But we're actually admitting in a way that we did it, leaving a substantial group of people outside it, having a different <coughs> expectation for them. On a good day, it was an expectation, expectation that we will care for you and care for you well. And of course, that's not to be sniffed at when you look at the history, when you look at people and the need to build asylums, institutions, to actually protect people. So when you come from that history, the 18th and 19th century into the 20th century, the objective of being able to care for people was not, in a sense, a wrong one, but how do you care for people and at the same time not lock them up, in a sense, encompass them in that care. How do you, as somebody once said, how do you care and not care? How do you care, but at the same time allow people to grow and make their own choices and decisions? So it's an interesting and um, broader landscape that we have around the UN Convention. Mm -hmm. um, at the, at the A man named, as I understand, Herman Santa Cruz from Chile, speaking at the, the signing of the Declaration, the Universal Declaration of 47, said a consensus as to the supreme value of the human person, a value that did not originate in the decision of a, of a, of a, of a worldly power, but rather in the fact of existing. Uh, that was that moment. I want to quickly and briefly turn to, uh, and he went on to say, a free people that have been inalienable rights live free from want and oppression and to fully develop one's personality. I want to come back to that in one second, but before <coughs> I do, where are we now in terms, this is just my thoughts or views, the UN Convention signed by a huge number of countries, ratified or to be ratified, uh, taken on board huge, fully by the European Union. Uh, so, yet we have in Europe a deep recession that's so often and more often thought about as an economic issue. I would put it to you that it's a social and a spiritual issue because the talk about economics and, and social services is, can we afford? The old countries of Europe, the richer ones, now have a crisis about how they fund their welfare systems, <coughs> which were very paternalistic, in that, here's the deal, you vote, you pay your taxes, and we give you entitlements, but you're very distant from it. I think there is a, a crisis for Europe and for the world, which is about the involvement and the participation of all aspects of civil society. And a huge and important element of civil society 
the organizations that have built up, the groups that have built up around the emancipation and support of people with disabilities. And disability, as much if not more than anything else, is a huge flashpoint that asks the question, what is the value of life? What is the value of people? And what are we going to do to vindicate that value? That has to be hotwired into the reform of nations and states post this recession that's going on. And I think when we go down in and look at the different articles, that is one journey that has to be travelled. I think all of us have to travel and carry what the convention is around right into the heart of how governments and public bodies do their work, how they include from the start rather than retrograde. My final point, which you indulgence. Um, I was getting up on Monday morning and listening to the radio, and like many people, I heard of the death of that young boy in, in um, Trevene. And David Walsh, I think, is 15 years of age. Don't thank you very much. He has been on a journey for four years, um, a journey with terminal cancer that ended on the Sunday. But some, I don't know him, I know nothing of his family. But you can use the language of he needed to be cared for, he needed to be looked after. But yet, in his final months, he had come as a young, still a young boy, to have insights about the most fundamental things of life. And he spoke very strongly publicly about particularly other young people who had lost that sense of, of staying with life. He made his mark out of, not away from what he had to deal with. And I take from that, and I will always hopefully remember that, as a moment, and we know other people who in their difficulties show their mettle. What this convention is asking us, <coughs> the notion of will and preference, the notion that everyone has a contribution to me. It's written here, but we actually know it when we reflect on people we know that have gone through difficult difficulties in their life, disability or whatever. And to come back to the man from Chile, the notion of one's personality. We are about getting to a place where people, we, that it is possible in some way or other for people to make their mark on life, not to just be the object, uh, simple and total object of care, to make their mark on life, that their signature is written through what they can do and the relationships that they can independently have with people. So look, that's a bit random. It's not getting into the convention, but I share it with you because I think it's important to, to when we're looking in and the possibilities of it, that we must, I very strongly, I think this is a powerful instrument not only for people with disabilities, but for the reformation of the societies that we live in. They have done a good job since the war, but there's further stuff to be done now to invade and to support the human rights. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you, Chair. Okay, I didn't know where we're going over time because he's my boss. Okay, next speaker is Prophet. Um, Teresa Degner, Professor of Law and Disability Studies at Evangel Evangel <coughs> sorry, Fachhochschule University of Applied Sciences in Portland, Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I'm Teresa Degner. And thanks, John, for the great introduction to this event. Um, I'm very grateful to the Disability Federation of Ireland and to the Centre for Disability 
law and policy for inviting me to this conference. Um, we all know that Ireland will soon ratify the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. And as a member of the committee which monitors this convention, I am very much looking forward to Ireland coming on board. I always enjoy coming to Ireland and as a long-time friend and colleague to, uh, of Jared Quinn, he has several times invited me to Ireland and I think it is amazing to see what <coughs> Jared and his colleagues have accomplished during the last decades here in Ireland but also internationally. He has established one of the leading think tanks in disability law and policy at the University of Galway. I think that Ireland can be proud of that. Uh, he has helped to organize the most exciting um, disability um, law summer schools every year. And I even think that there is no one in this world who has had an, such an impact as Jared on getting the convention adopted as it has now. Um, when we wrote the background study to, to this convention back in 2001, I think um, neither Jared nor me could have imagined that a decade later we would have such a terrific treaty and that I would be sitting on the monitoring body whereas Ireland would still be on the ratification process. <laughs> but I think this is how history develops sometimes. It is only partly predict predictable and full of surprises. And I think the main thing is that Ireland is coming on board. And that's one of the reasons why we are sitting here and talking about the convention. Now, let me talk, turn to my presentation. Um, next slide. Uh, within the next 18 minutes, I would like to talk about five items. First, I would like to give you a short introduction into how is it that states become a party to this treaty. Second, um, I would like to talk a little bit about the... Oh, slide is not on. No. <laughs> That's not the second slide. We need to go back. Yeah. Okay. First, becoming a party to the treaty. Second, the CRPD committee and how it monitors this Human Rights Convention. <coughs> Thirdly, I want to talk a little bit about what we call the reporting cycle and issues of dialogue, how that functions, how we monitor. <coughs> the role of civil society will be my fourth point and finally I would like to uh, give some outlook and an example. So next slide, please. First, how does how do states and regional organizations, by the way, this is the first human rights treaty ever to allow regional organizations to become members and the EU, European Union, as you know, has already acceded to the convention. Okay, this treaty allows for two procedures, mainly two procedures to become a party. One is a two-step procedure and one of the other is a one-step procedure. Um, the two-step procedure which most state parties take, and Ireland is also going this road. Um, first, uh, the country signs the convention, and then as a second step, it ratifies. And usually ratification um, is done through adopting a law uh, by the legislative body of the country. And the other one-step procedure is an accession or formal confirmations, which means that uh, the, 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 the um, binding agreement that this um, regional organization or that country is um, being bound by the, uh, the consent that this, this organization or the state is being bound by the treaty is done in one step only. Now, next slide, please. What is, no, that's not the next slide. Yeah, what's the difference between signature and ratification? A signature means it's an indication that the state will take steps to be bound. It's a promise the state makes. And with that promise, the treaty has not become a binding law of the, the country yet. But it, 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 the, the state is under obligation to refrain from counter action, get action, to do anything which is in counter action or which contradicts 
the treaty. But it's already good. It's already some kind of safeguard that, you, that, that the treaty is working for, for your country. And with ratification, that is the step which legally binds the state to implement the Human Rights Treaty, subject to valid reservations, declarations, and understandings. And some, a couple of countries have issued declarations and, and reservations, which means that they say that they will be bound by the treaty except for certain provisions within the treaty. Next um, slide, please. Now I come to my second point. <coughs> um, how, how does the CRPD committee work? What is it? Okay, first, the CRPD committee consists of 18 independent experts, 18 people from around the world. Um, at the moment, of these 18 members, 17 have a disability. So um, it's disabled people, the majority is disabled people themselves. Most of us are, um, some of us are lawyers, some of our, us are politicians, others are coming from civil society, NGOs, and so on. The CRPD, the convention has now 130 parties, and that means those have already rectified and 155 signatories. So, um, if you think of United Nations membership of being 194 and 195, it varies sometimes, you can see the majority has already come on board. The majority of the, the this country's world have, has already decided that they want to be bound by this new Human Rights Treaty. Then you see also on the slide an abbreviation is called OP and then it says 76. OP means optional protocol and that's a kind of a second treaty which comes along with the Convention on the Rights of uh, People with Disabilities and it gives, specific, I mean states can choose whether they want to also ratify this optional protocol or not and it gives opportunities to some specific procedures like inquiry procedure or individual complaints. So how many reports have we received so far? So far? Um, usually when a state ratifies, within two years that state has to submit a report to our committee and then after that every four years. And we review these reports. Well, out of the 130 parties have, having ratified the country, 45 have submitted reports to us and 50 states are still overdue. And this is from August 2012. So in August 2012, we did not have yet 130 um, countries, if anyone wants to do the math. Um, we have by now only seven countries fully reviewed, and I will talk about the review process a little later, but I just want to tell you that it is, takes some time to review a country. It's not that hard. At the moment, we have five weeks of meeting time. The committee meets every April and every September, and one uh, two weeks and the other is three weeks in Geneva and in that time we review the reports. This committee is not the only agent uh, operating in the human rights mechanism of the United Nations and, and nor with respect to the um, treaty itself. There are ten other treaty bodies, it's important to know that. We have other conventions like the Children's Rights Convention, the Women's Rights Convention, the, anti, uh, the, the, the Convention Against Racial Discrimination, and so on, in which each of these treaty bodies has a committee. And that's important to know because in Geneva we try to, to, to work together with the other treaty bodies. We want to pick up what they have said. When the island submitted its report to the Women's Convention, uh, to the Women's Committee, then we look at what the Women's Committee had said to Ireland uh, regarding respecting women's rights and then we pick it up and see uh, whether we can build upon that regarding disabled women. So there are other 10 treaty bodies and then also it is important to know that next to the committee, the, the, the CRPD, the Convention on the Rights of People with Disability, the disability is also monitored by what is called a state party conference, uh, which meets annually in New York City. It's not really seen as a monitoring body, but the treaty text says that if it wants, it can do whatever they want to do, they can involve in monitoring. 
in this state party conference, state meet, state parties meet and exchange uh, ex their ex they share their experiences. How is it going with implementing the treaty? What works and what doesn't work? And where are the big problems? And I think that is also important to know that if there is not only the committee in Geneva, but there is also the state party state party conference in New York, and then. Most important of all, there is a national monitoring system. Um, this is one of it's the first human rights treaty demanding that state parties need to establish not only international monitoring but also a national national monitoring system, and that is what's going to happen in Ireland as well. That is important, and our committee is very much depending on this national monitoring system because whatever is not done at home, we cannot in Geneva kind of um, install it or start it. it. It is becoming clearer and clearer the more state party we review is that without a, a meaningful national monitoring body, uh, our work at the international level <laughs> remains very little. That means little to be done. Okay, next slide. Um, what are the procedures and working methods? And for, for those of you who can see, you can see um, a picture there which is not very professionally taken because I have a normal camera and I took a picture. It's a picture of our committee um, at the, uh, from a year ago, when we, uh, September 2012, when we had China, uh, review China, and that is our old chairperson, the new chairperson comes in the next slide, which is now a woman, but that was Ron McCallum one of the great chairperson of our committees. Anyway, back to what are our procedures and working methods. I already mentioned the state party reports, <coughs> and they are in bold on this slide because they are the most important mechanism we have. States have to write, produce a report around six, between 16 and 80 pages, and in that report they have to show how they implement the treaty and they should identify which are the problems in their country and what they think how they can overcome the problems and they should also prove in that state report how they engage with civil society because this, the CRPD says at, uh, at, at various places in the text that it is very important that uh, DPOs, disabled people organizations and other civil society, organi uh, organi civil society agents are involved in the implementation process, and not only in the implementation process, also already in the ratification process. So, um, next to the state report, party reports, we have individual complaints and inquiry procedures, and these are in the optional protocol, the other treaty which comes along with the CRPD, which I talked about a minute ago. And um, Individual complaints means that individuals or groups of individuals can come to our committee and say, my rights in my country have been violated and uh, take action on that. We are not court. We cannot say, uh, okay, we, we grant damage to you. But what we can say is that yes, um, this country, this state party has violated the rights of that person. And we recommend what that state party can do. We have a lot of individual complaints already. We have over 100 um, submissions or petitions. Um, in, currently, we have eight cases um, registered, which means that we take them on board and we, we deal with them. And then we're first we have to decide, are they admissible? And then we decide on the merits. And we have three cases decided. So then. Their inquiry procedure is also in the optional protocol, and that means in cases of grave and systematic violations of human rights, our committee can be asked by anyone, uh, or at least for, by the people in the country, to come and inquire and see what, what's happening there. And currently we have uh, also a, a, a case of inquiry into uh, this, uh, in a European country, but I. Uh, and, and until we have decided or on, on it, we, I cannot talk about it in public, but it is interesting that it, the first inquiry procedure is in Europe, and it's uh, on economic, social, and cultural rights. Um, then there we also have early, war early warning measures. <coughs> early warning measures um, are not in the treaty, but they are in our um, uh, working methods and rules of procedures, and 
that is a mechanism where people can come to us and say, please take immediate action, because unless you take immediate action, something terrible will happen, because we cannot wait until you decide on that case or until the state third party report is being reviewed. And also we have now an early warning uh, case. Also again, I cannot talk about the details, it's still <coughs> confidential, but it is again economic, social, and cultural rights, and it is in a European country. Um, then, first, we have general comments and statements. General comments are kind of interpretation of, 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 uh, the, of some of the articles or a, a, a specific article in the treaty. And we say what is the legal content, the normative content, and what are the state or party obligations under this article. And they are kind of authoritative statements, and most of the treaty bodies adopt them. And currently we're working on two, uh, no, three uh, general comments. One is on accessibility, and the other is on legal capacity, and the, the third is on disabled women. And statements are also, um, well, they are public statements on things we find important, and we have had several statements on natural disasters. Okay, next slide. I need to hurry up a little bit because time is running. Um, I come to the reporting cycle. What happens when a report comes to us? Then what happens is the reporting cycle. And you find that on the slide, and it starts with a state report, it comes to us, we read it, and then we adopt so called list of issues. List of issues are questions we have to the country. And we say, please explain how, we want more explanation on this statistic. Or we want to know how many kids are going to be in integrated education. Or how many people are unemployed, uh, disabled people are unemployed in your country. So then we, the, the state has to respond to the list of issues. And the next uh, step is the constructive dialogue. The, the, the representatives of the government come to Geneva and talk with us. And that's what we call constructive dialogue. And uh, we talk, talk with them about their state report, we ask them what they think they uh, should change and we think, give them our opinion where we think that they're still not in compliance with the treaty and what they can do better. And then after the constructive dialogue, which usually takes uh, one or two days, we adopt the so-called concluding observations and they are published and that's what called the jurisprudence of the treaty bodies. Okay, next slide. <clears throat> what kind of issues are taking place uh, or what have come up in the seven state reports so far? What are the problems of the state parties so far? Well, one is that most state parties do not understand what is the human rights model of disability. Uh, most of you might have heard the CRPD introduces a paradigm shift from the medical model to the human rights model of disability. And it, it means that disabled people should not be seen as problems, but as, as, as citizens with rights, as rights holders. And it should also be seen that you, disability is a human rights issue, and it should also uh, be <clears throat> understood by this state, but also by everyone um, implementing disability policy, so also service providers, that disabled people are human rights subject. And human rights are specific rights in that they are given to us with birth. We do not gain human rights and we cannot lose human rights. So there is often the myth that disability or impairment may restrict our capacity to exercise human rights, but there is no such a thing as um, human rights capacity being um, hindered or uh, yeah, uh, impaired by impairment. Every human being has human rights and they cannot be taken away. And so it is a myth to say that because you are of such a severe, severe, severe disability, you cannot exercise that human right. That shift must take place and that's why so many laws, especially guardianship laws, need to be changed. There is no such a thing as legal incapacity because of impairment. It's because of the surrounding. It's because people don't have access to, to means to express their wills and preferences. Mm -hmm. preferences. 
um, ending institutionalization is another big issue. Most tech parties think if you if they change just the <coughs> biggest institution into a smaller one, then they comply with the convention. But that is not true. Article 19 says clearly disabled people have the right to choose to, to where and with whom they want to live. And that living has to be in context of independent living. And there, in the, I don't know of any institution, and the whole committee is with me on the same view that there, there is such a there, there, there's a possibility to do independent living in, in an institution. So state parties, when they ratify, they make a promise that they abolish institutions and that they it, it, um, realize community living and independent living. Um, abolishing segregation is another issue. Uh, many countries say that, um, look, we have really polished up our external education schools. <coughs> and uh, while we have increased the number of disabled kids going to integrated school, and we say that is not enough. We want to have a plan how you end segregation. And there are only very, very few exceptions where we could live with segregated education. And it, that relates to maybe deaf culture. And single, single, some exceptional cases where some part of the education might, should take place in segregated settings. But the, the CRPD is very clear. It says stop segregation. So, of course, replacing guardianship is another big issue. Most uh, countries do not understand that it is not enough to make it better or just have a little bit of guardianship and then um, do reform and do it slowly. But we, what we think is that really countries have to understand that guardianship is not in compliance with CRPD and that what we need to do is re replace substituted decision making with supported decision making. Freedom and equality for disabled women is in another issue. Uh, many countries still have sterilization laws for disabled women specifically. There are countries which do not allow disabled women to marry just because they are disabled, deaf, or blind, or whatever. Same with disabled children. Way too many countries think that institutionalization is a, is a solution for disabled children. I need to hurry up because time is running, so next slide. I want to talk about the role of civil society. What can civil society do? In our <coughs> work, civil society is extremely important. If you look at the reporting cycle again, there at several points we need the input of civil society. For instance, when the state report is put forward to our committee, what we need is an alternative report. The states have a tendency, a tendency to say, okay, look, we are a great country. We are doing wonderful things for disabled. What we need is we need the truth, and we can get it better if we have a, a different point of view from civil society. So what we really rely on is so-called alternative report or shadow reporting, where a lot of credible information needs to be given to us, and that's what we confront the government people with when they come to Geneva. And we say, okay, look, we have information that in your country then, then there is a high number of deaths in institutions. And it's not in your report, we understand that because we, you don't want to look at the nasty things, but please explain us what, and what are you going to do about it. Um, recommendations for list of issues also come from civil society as well as recommendations for uh, questions and concluding observations. And so without the civil society, our work would be impossible to do. We rely heavily, heavily on what uh, civil society sends us to. Geneva. So next slide. Next last slide. I would look at an example from Geneva. <coughs> I think ratification is only the beginning. We all need to understand that, and I, I say that specifically to countries like Ireland or the Netherlands, which we will hear later on about, who think that they need to fix everything before they ratify. Mm. I think that the <coughs> convention or all the treaty bodies assume that it, the country makes this promise to be bound by the treaty, but then the, the implementation is a process. And we need to learn. And we often we don't know the answers yet. We don't know how to replace this guardianship in many ways. We just know that we need supported decision making. But how is it actually going to work? 
we need to have the constructive dialogue in Geneva, but also at home on how to implement, and we need to go step by step. That's why I think uh, it is okay to ratify, even though the country needs to do a little bit here and there, <laughs> not only a little bit. I think every country needs to do that. Mm. Implementation of human rights is a process and it has to be reviewed again and again. Mm. I also think that one step is not enough. We need to see how it has worked. If we close down big institutions, what need do we need to do in order to enable community living? And has it worked well? So that's what the reporting is for. We come back to Geneva and we have a constructive dialogue again and again. We need meaningful, meaningful participation of civil society. And international monitoring needs to be complemented by effective national monitoring. And on the picture, I have a picture from Japan, and this is the last example I want to talk about. It is um, a picture of a court victory, which was gained this year. The Tokyo District Court ruled on 14th March of 2013 that it was unconstitutional for the election law to deprive persons under guardianship of their right to vote in Japan. The case was in initiated by Mrs. Nagoya, a woman with Down syndrome, who felt discriminated against because she couldn't vote once she was put under guardianship and her father was her guardian, is her guardian. She invoked the CRPD, which Japan has signed but not ratified, and she won the case. <coughs> and uh, the judge, Yosuka Makota, of the District Court of Tokyo agreed and ruled in her favor, and upon delivering the ruling, he said to Mrs. Nagoya, and it was really great to, to read about this case, because the, the court also tried to speak in easy to understand language. He said, please use your political rights and take part in society, be proud and lead a good life. And I picked this example because I clear, it clearly shows that even before ratification, the CRBD can make a change. Okay, thank you for your... Thank you, Professor. Um, now, folks, we're running a little over time, but we all know we can rely on Martin to be short and sharp. And straight to several points. So, Martin Optum from BFI to talk for representa representation of people with disabilities. Hello. Hello. Um, I, I'm, feeling, I'm feeling in a, a strange kind of mood. One is... Um, I, I feel really... Uh, really great today listening to what's been achieved and the amount of years it has taken and then I'm also saying who in the name of God would give me 10 minutes on the microphone to say what I like <laughs> so please people uh, anyway just to say to Gerard and uh, that's how we know you Gerard some people call you the prof what we call you Gerard and uh, to Trace and to many others on an inter and our work on an international level and bringing about the UNCRPD. Thank you, thank you, thank you very much. Uh, so many people here locally in Ireland as well played our parts, uh, uh, very much so. I'm thinking of very much this morning, Eddie Donald Tolan, Frank Mulcahy and a few other people like that and John, as, John Dolan as well. So we're, in many ways, we're delighted to be at this point um, I, I, I can't tell you in terms of uh, representation of people with disabilities per se because there isn't a mandate from me or for anybody else at the moment to do that. But I can talk you through what, the, what it means to me and what I know it means to so many more people in the community that I come from. Uh, just lift up a little bit. Yeah. Um, one, I mean, it tells me you have a capacity, Mark. And we recognize and we're going to recognize your capacity. And if your capacity isn't strong enough, we are going to put support in your in to, to make sure that it's strong enough. Right? 
we are going to help you to make the choices, the best choices for you. Right? We are going to roll back your history of segregation, your dependency, and we are going to help you to be fully in tune and be in the driving seat of your own life. And to me, that's saying, wonderful, great. It means now that I can get on a bus like anybody else, or if it was a young version of me, I can expect to go to the same school as everybody else. With the support, with the support. It also means that I can be ex expecting to be uh, employed, right? Not 80% of us unemployed. I can expect and dream that I will be part of a full society. That in turn, that society uh, will see me as fully inclusive and being part of that society. So yes, it's recognizing that, particularly in 12 and 19 and so many other things. And guess what it's saying to many of us, and I really take great pleasure in saying this. You were right all along when we broke all the barriers down when we broke out of institutions, when we did all these kind of things, when we started independent living, when we did all these things in, in the country. Yes, Christy, you were right. right. And keep it up, but we now need you and others more than ever to make sure that we can get from where we were to where we need to be. I would say also there's a huge challenge to our service providers, or whatever we call it nowadays. The reality of the situation is, I am Martin, I still need help to go to bed, I still need help at night time, the UN hasn't changed that, I need it in the morning, I need sign all the time, right? And that's the reality. But what it's saying to me very clearly is, I can have that on an individual arrangement, right? So no more will money be sent somewhere else to keep me happy. That day is gone, right? It also says a couple of other things to me that, uh, that I now need to step up and my expectations for me as an individual with disability has to change. And that's really hard. It is really, really hard. Huh? Okay, it's really hard because forever and a day I was cared for. I'm not always sure, I'm not ever sure that I was cared about, but certainly I was cared for. So for me, and for many people with disabilities. Um, I'm going to say we're going to have a wonderful life, but before we say that, I want to say, is David still here? Yeah. Right, we have to stop doing the wrong thing in order to start getting things right. At the present moment, there is huge amount of money being paid over to continue providing the wrong kind of services. They are services very often institutional. They are services segregated. They are services that don't enhance us as people or don't, uh, would I say, ratify in ourselves our rights. So we need you, David, and all your colleagues, please, please, give us leadership. And what we ask you to do is make sure the wrong things don't continue. And we will build the right ways in partnership with you. We are going to have a wonderful life, but I call on each of us as people within this disability. Ratification is only the beginning, as Trace has said. It's what we do with it 
It's what we do with our lives, etc. Do you hear that, Paddy? Hmm. Right? Okay? Okay. Well then, let's get on and do it and we'll get together and we'll find that we have a better life. Thank you. Thank you, Mark, and straight to the point, as I can say. Now, the next speaker is um, Agnes Van Rijen, and she's going to speak on the experiences of the implementation of UNCRPD. last year to, to, to take part in the wonderful summer school of the CDLP. Again, many thanks because I learned so many lessons there and I'm honored to be able to share some of my experiences from the Netherlands today with you on implementation on a local level of the CRPD. First of all, um, I want to share some uh, points on the situation in the Netherlands. Thank you. Um, in the Netherlands, uh, disability as a matter of human rights is mostly unknown to most people, both many people with disabilities and others. <laughs> and the shift in the way that we look at disability issues that the CRPD so strongly presents is not widely spread. We tend to look at disability as a problem of the individual, as Theresa uh, said. And we tend to look at disability um, at handling dis accessibility issues as a way of being kind to people with disabilities, not as solving a human rights violation. We are segregating children with disabilities in special schools. There's about a little more than 42% of children with disabilities in segregated schools, and not less than 16,000 children with disabilities are not even in school because there's an they are not, not accepted in any school in their neighborhood. So, what is in there? The Netherlands. Oh, sorry, it's my abbreviation of... Yeah. Um, and isolating people with mental impairments for sometimes long periods in a locked room is seen as treatment up to the day of today instead of torture. We picture human rights viola violations as not happening in the Netherlands. It's like beating up political prisoners in some faraway countries, like maybe Russia or Latin America or wherever. It's not happening in our country. We are civilized and we don't connect uh, human rights issues with people with disabilities. Um, we are in the middle of the process of uh, learning how to, uh, the world that surrounds us creates problems and disables people to participate and make their contribution. <coughs> we haven't, as you have, ratified the CRPD yet. In 2007 we signed and ratification is now planned for July 2015. And I'm wondering which of us will be first <laughs> <laughs> and how we will get there. I will not get deeply into uh, the reasons why Netherlands is so slow to ratify. I just want to mention that it has to do with our legal system. Um, we usually change laws first and then ratify international treaties, but that's not the full story. There are also strong political uh, concerns about our sovereignty, uh, fear of costs, uh, of course, and also the view that the Netherlands does not need international treaties on people with disabilities because people with disabilities are very well taken care of in our country. And so we are far from understanding that there is a difference between uh, taking care of people and having possibilities and opportunities on an equal foot with others um, to participate and to make your contribution. Next slide, please. Um, we are um, organized, people with disabilities are organized in, in mainly three 
comes, like uh, people, uh, persons with mental impairments, and uh, organizations of persons with intellectual impairments, and persons with physical or sensory impairments. And historically, we have been very divided and not communicating a lot. I think this is part of our problem. It's also part of our problem um, in uh, implementing uh, the CRPD. And now, for some years, we have an organization called the Coalition for Inclusion, and we are trying to uh, get together um, as different organizations and sit together on what does the CRPD means to us and, and how can we understand it and um, share ideas and also um, connect to prepare for our talks with the Dutch government on the ratification process and also on um, our visions on what should a national action plan be like. And step by step we are learning from each other and, and connected because also between people with different um, disabilities there were thoughts like from the uh, community of people with physical disabilities there was like um, we don't want to cooperate with people with intellectual impairments because we are seen as crazy as crazy people uh, so many times already and if we uh, team up with them we will not even be taken seriously anyway uh, not, not for the least bit so there has been very big barriers also in not only the image of people without disabilities have about us, but also in between. That has hindered us from working together, but now we are starting to read because it's necessary. And we can benefit from each other. In 2010 and 2011, uh, the coalition organized several meetings nationwide and in local communities on uh, the CRPD to explore the treaty and how to make it real. And it was kind of a way to start to get knowledgeable together about the CRPD. Um, but we were still waiting for ratification and, and we felt like we are kind of stuck. We were, we, the only thing we could do was wait for the Netherlands to ratify and, and uh, try to speed up that process, but we couldn't do anything yet about implementation. And then at some point, someday, uh, some people sat together and said, well, maybe we can do something, maybe we can start now by implementing it. Why um, would we wait? And why um, should we wait? It's not necessary. The ratification? Next slide. Uh, sorry, next slide. Yeah, it's there. Um, someday we will ratify, and in the meantime, we can start to use the CRPD now. And that is what the project Treaty Around the Corner that I'm working with is uh, doing. We are set up to uh, spread knowledge and awareness uh, on human rights and on the CRPD among people with disabilities and among all others in society. Because we feel that everybody is part of the solution and everybody needs to be informed about the rights of people with disabilities and what needs to be done. Because we need to do it together. So, uh, the treaty around the corner uh, is not only that you see the bulb. If you can see, you see a bulb on the slide, and that's mm. the bulb of enlightenment. And we get to know about uh, the CRPD and about human rights. And then you see some two mouths. At least I hope that's what you see. <laughs> I, so I'm kind of fiddling around with some paper. And, but what it means is that we need to get together and connect as, as people from all parts of society <coughs> talk together about the possibilities and the opportunities we see on um, implementing uh, the CRPD. <coughs> and it also means to, uh, listening to each other's uh, stories. And um, So that's what we do in the project. We get together, uh, we spread knowledge, we connect the different stakeholders and we start not only talking but we use the meetings to start up to make a plan in this local um, uh, community and to think about how is the situation here and uh, what could we do about it and what would the CRPD say on this and so what are the first steps to move forward. So we um, we are still in the middle of having these uh, meetings 
and we have it in every region. Um, and we are making plans. But before going more into that, I want to say something about the eye that's there, and it's the eye for monitoring. Theresa has mentioned it. Um, um, what we try to do in the project is also develop a, a monitoring instrument. It's uh, from uh, it's kind of a large scale listening we call it, and it means that there is a website somewhere, and people can put in stories on their experiences with inclusion and exclusion, and everybody, also partners or parents or neighbors or whoever. Uh, things I have an experience with that can put in stories and tell about what was it about, was it about transport or had it to do with legal capacity or whatever. And so that's the way that we try to collect stories from all over the countries and we do it because we think we can, we want to use the day-to-day -day experiences from people with disabilities themselves to make up our shadow report later. So it's an investment in the future. Okay, next slide. Um, the target groups of the tree around the corner um, are, of course, people with disabilities and their organization, um, local governments. Um, they are a very important uh, party that we try to team up with, and their policy makers. And also, we try to involve people in, like, catering business, uh, uh, shop owners. Um, uh, uh, educators, people of school, employers, and also we try to involve people from the care sector. But our main uh, target groups are people with disabilities and uh, local government uh, people. Because, um, of course, when you talk about implementing the COPD, national government is on in the first place to uh, do work, change laws, etc. But uh, real life is uh, in the villages and in the cities and uh, that's where we live and that's where the changes also have to be made, need to be made. And it's about all uh, policy areas, uh, transport, housing, whatever, it's all mentioned. Okay, yeah. Um, okay, so... <laughs> Irish minutes, so, yeah. <laughs> so uh, what did we do? Uh, we uh, are organizing and, and having uh, meetings. Oh yeah, sorry. Thanks. Thank you for assisting. Um, we have uh, meetings, uh, at least one in every region in, in the Netherlands. You see here some pictures from the meetings that have been uh, there. Um, before and after the meeting also activities take place uh, with people <coughs> to uh, involve the several stakeholders because we feel like we won't get um, so many people together if we only just send out an invitation. We need to explain to people uh, that we want to be there, why it is important to be there, and why it is also in their uh, interest to be there and to uh, participate. And um, the COPD, of course, is on the agenda. There is uh, presentations there are on uh, the CRPD after and, and then we start making uh, the plans uh, you see uh, there is a picture on the left down of uh, people working um, in a kind of a cook thing studio and that's where we worked with like uh, 20 people from uh, different stakeholders and we while preparing a meal for each other we talked about what could we do and what is our, our experiences and later on put that, wrote that on the walls and uh, put it into plans. Um, we also try to um, involve people to get an ambassador, to be an ambassador for the CRPD. And after the meetings we, we uh, keep in touch with them and we follow up on plans and say how is it going and, and what, do, what things do you confront, are there any problems? And we organize follow-up meetings, especially for people uh, in the local governments. Um, and we uh, try to um, organize uh, meetings with only them, so that they can ask all questions they have, and also maybe questions they might think were awkward, and talk what is their role and what can be their role in implementation on a local level. 
and we try to convince them to um, work for all their citizens, not only for 85%. So, um, I need to move on. What are our results so far? Next slide. Thank you. Um, we've had uh, every meeting 2,230 participants locally. Um, local and regional governments get very well uh, involved. Um, there are about 50 CRPD ambassadors, that means people who have said, yes, I want to do everything I can with uh, the people I work with uh, to um, spread the news about the CRPD and try to um, uh, implement it in the work that I do or in, in the way I uh, live and am active in my neighborhood. There are five local governments who have ratified the CRPD so far. Of course, it has not, what, not, not any legal status, and that's what we tell them. But we say, you know, it's the commitment that you say to your citizens, we are there for all of you, not only for that 85%. We want to work with you to um, uh, make our, uh, the place that we live, make it uh, a good place for all of us and make it possible so that everybody can contribute because we think that it's important. We don't know how to get there, but we will want we want to get there together with you. Um, and a lot of plans are made and it's a very exciting uh, process. What we learned, next slide please, what the lessons we learned was that if we want to get people involved, we really first have to invest in connecting uh, with them, in getting to them, maybe have individual uh, appointments with them um, and, and tell them uh, a bit in advance of the meetings about the CRPD and why it is important to them. And, um, and that plays out very well. We find that we have, uh, as I said, a lot of people from local governments and policy makers. We don't get as much um, people from the business world and uh, shop owners, etc. We get, of course, some carers, we get some people from uh, schools. But we, it must, to be honest, we have also invested less in those stakeholders. So, you know, you, you, I think you say you reap what you sow or something. Um, what we also find is that a lot of people have very little knowledge on human rights and have a little understanding of what it is, so it, one meeting will not be enough and also three meetings will not be enough. We, we have to commit ourselves to do a continuous uh, investment and continuous attention to uh, informing people. Um, oh yeah, the last point is that that's one of our arguments that we use to <coughs> talk with business people is uh, so you said you were talking about uh, economic crisis and uh, business is going down, but what would you say about if you could earn like 11 or 12 percent extra sales? What, what would you think about that? Wouldn't that be welcome? And if you put your business open to everybody, then that's what you might get. Okay, last slide, please. Um, this is uh, a statement I found lately and I'm very impressed by it. If you think you are too small to have an impact, try sleeping with a mosquito in the room. So, thank you for your attention. Together we can move mountains. Thank you for that, Agnes. Folks, we have a tea and coffee break now. We're a bit behind on time, so we expect to get your coffee quickly. <laughs> the Centre for Disability Law and Policy at NUIG. And um, we'll have a lot to say about most of that. Okay, John. Thanks. Um, <clears throat> thanks very much. Um, yeah, just to get back to the question of sanctions, I think it's really, really important. Um, and it's unrealistic to expect the... Oh, does this work? It works now. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's a non-Apple um, It's unrealistic to expect the United Nations... Yeah. Sorry? Louder. 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 Yeah, sure. Even louder. Um, it's unrealistic to expect the United Nations to be imposing sanctions 
uh, because that's not normally a function of international treaty law, although, although it can be. Um, but local regional organizations, governments themselves, can create sanctions, <coughs> and the mentioning of the EU is a classic example because there the European Commission, to its great credit, has recommended new proposals for the EU structural funds, such that governments can only use the monies to ease the process of transition from institutions into community settings. And if they violate that, well, the power of the purse kicks in and the payment can be suspended. I mean, that's an example of a real sanction. Of course, the European Council opposes that, but we have to remain, uh, we have to see how that works out. The most important thing is not the sanction, it's whether the government internalizes the messages of the convention into its DNA. That as a matter of reflex, they automatically think, what should we be doing along the lines of giving effect to the convention? And I thought the Spanish example was a really, really interesting example of where a government had in fact successfully done that. Um, also, uh, Agnes's presentation is very instructive because you own the convention just as much as the government owns the convention. What you've been doing in the Netherlands is really, really inspiring. And I think afterwards we've got to regroup and think how do we take ownership of it? How do we create an ambassadorial core in this country from Athlone to Paris Iveen, which would be absolutely fantastic. Um, I was actually asked to update people. Now, I don't know what update means, but the way I decode that is Where's the last remaining obstacle to ratification by this country to the Convention? And we, like the Netherlands, will not ratify something unless we're pretty confident that our laws and policies will pass muster. So it turns out to be the case that the most, uh, well, the only uh, obstacle remaining is the reform of our legal capacity legislation. I just want to show you a few slides from the previous presentation I made um, for Amnesty about what I consider to be red lines beyond which the government cannot go in enacting new legislation. By the way, they've said for the last five or six years the legislation is impending. This time it's real. This time it will happen. Um, <clears throat> uh, probably before the summer recess. So it's really important that you get your, your act together, as Donald Tulin put it many years ago famously, and figure out what your red lines are, what you support, what you will argue for amendments for in committee through David Stanton's committee, etc., etc. And curiously enough, it gets back to one of the first things Tracy Degener and I did way back in the mid 1990s from a policy perspective. We did a lot of stuff from a purely academic perspective, but as you get older and older, that's not the stuff that matters, right? Um, we did a part of a famous report on the invisibility of European citizens. And it's funny how we've peeled away all of the shields that conceal people in lots of areas like accessibility, yet to be perfected, community living, yet to be implemented. And the last remaining one is the most obvious one, which probably we should have tackled from the beginning, which is giving voice back to people to make decisions for themselves in their own life, period. Um, and it's curious that that's the one that's holding us up now in Ireland and all countries around the world are having problems trying to move from one very outdated system to terra incognito, a completely new space, and to try and innovate with that respect. So if you could change the slides, is there anybody changing the slides? You have it. Or, or do I? <laughs> you have the power. I demand support. <laughs> In the way. Here we go. Um, I just want to mention this, and this is very important, because when you enter into a treaty regime, when you make promises, basically, that's all you do in a treaty regime, it's expected that you take your promises seriously. So if there's a paradigm shift or a really transformative moment happening within a particular provision, it's expected that you will internalize that in a deep way and not just as a cosmetic or decorative thing. Now that's very important when it comes to our legislation to be enacted shortly. I just thought I'd mention that. And everybody, there's a widespread consensus that Article 12 of the Convention is actually emblematic of the entire mission of the Convention, which is really restoring people to being centered in their own lives and assuming power and control over their own lives. So the obligations go to the heart of the Convention. Um, it's not some peripheral thing to be progressively achieved over time. 
Secondly, um, the real transformation was away from protection, which usually ends up overprotecting and ending up in regulated lives, which none of us accept for ourselves, toward a support paradigm whereby frailty, if frailty exists, is going to become the occasion for more positive interventions to support people. And that really is the paradigm shift that's going on in Article 12 in the Convention. The other way of explaining this is that this is about expanding civil rights, or at least putting in place the mechanism to make those civil rights real for people. It's actually not about taking away right. If you're using the mentality of taking away of right, you're going to be looking at due process protections, you're going to be looking at the courts, and rightly so, because we need all of those protections if the state is going to be taking away rights. This is really, really important to the institutional mechanism the government chooses in its draft legal capacity bill to be published in the next few weeks, and I'll come back to that. So here's my greatest hits, and it'd be lovely to have Theresa respond at least briefly to them, not in terms of yes-no answers for what the committee will accept, but just in general terms. By the way, I am at a conference later in the afternoon, but I'm on first, so they have to wait for me. <laughs> um, task number one is the act should enshrine will and preference. Now that's positive. Flip it over negatively, what that means is best interests no longer has a place. Think about that. Uh, purported objective standards about what's good for you doesn't have a place. Even the English, when they enacted their uh, Mental Health Act in 2004, was it? Uh, tried to make sure that best interests, if it were preserved, were interpreted in light of the previously expressed will and preference of the person. Okay? So that's, that's number one. Number two is the Act should acknowledge an evolving spectrum of supports. And I guess one of the more important things to really learn here is that when we're talking about supports, we're not talking about state apparatuses delivering supports. And we're not talking about service delivery organizations in the old center since delivering supports. We're actually talking about the supports that exist in your community that are conspicuous by their absence for people with disabilities and connecting them up and acknowledging them and giving some legal effect to them. How much is that going to cost? Not hardly a dime. Hardly a dime. Um, so uh, I'll, I'll go, go on because time is of the essence, but I just want to make that point. Task number three, I think, is the, the act should be really clear on what the legal implications of wrapping in these supports around people are. Uh, in Canada, for example, if it's difficult for you to communicate your will and preference, or even to form it, there may be representation agreements whereby your circle of support, and you all know about circles of support, is your representative group, and therefore third parties like a dentist, a doctor, a landlord, a banker, is obliged to, to uh, uh, respond accordingly. Okay? So, also it's very interesting that Article 12 says, you have your right to legal capacity in all spheres. Now you may have noticed in the 2008 Heads of Bill that it was quite uh, um, interesting in the politics going on. You have on the one hand the bill giving you your legal capacity and then you have a section tucked into the end saying, by the way, that doesn't apply to voting, sexual relations, mental this, blah blah blah, blah blah blah. So whole islands of immunity are carved out from the bill. Uh, it's my impression, at least, that's contrary to Article 12 of the UN Convention. At the very least, if you're going to have difficulty rebalancing things in these spheres, you should have some mechanism in the bill that says, and by the way, in as much as it is possible, these spheres have to be interpreted in light of this new bill on legal capacity. Watch out for that one. Um, task number four, the Act should provide for effective safeguards with respect to the support regime. Um, this is really difficult, and it's probably not something we can do now in advance. It's probably something we have to open up a process on, because mistakes will be made, uh, as well as interesting successes will be achieved. Um, and the danger, as usual, is that safeguards uh, could be used as a Trojan horse to reintroduce notions of best interests, that supplant the will and preference of the person. So there's a very elusive line between supports that um, underpin the person and supports that could potentially undermine the person. 
But I guess the more important point is that it's not really possible in advance to say where that line is. But for sure, unless you open up the process, you're never ever going to be able to discover where that line is. Uh, and that's important. Task number five, and I think this is really, really crucial here in this country. Uh, if we're to create this exploratory space, innovative space, if we're going to make a stab at expanding the civil rights of people with disabilities, then we've got to have an appropriate institutional mechanism to drive that forward. Um, we've got to have a champion to drive that forward. And the tasks basically are to, to begin in as much as we can connecting people with these supports, wonderful community um, development stuff going on in this country that's got to be tapped into in this context. We've got to use this institutional framework um, in a way that is animated by this philosophy, not animated by the protection philosophy. All right, I'll speak plainly. That's code word for this shouldn't be in the court system. This shouldn't be in the court service system. That's not to denigrate those systems, but their default setting is completely different to the default setting that we're trying to achieve under Article 12. So if there is a new institutional apparatus to be set up, it's got to be an office of public support rather than an office of guardianship or public guardianship or whatever. <laughs> That's a, a Russian proverb that says, trust but verify. <laughs> I, always, I always use that. Um, and also, it's really interesting that this body should, I think, be developing the codes of good practice and good conduct and clarifying where these really difficult lines actually are over time. Um, okay. Task number six, the Act should be looking outwards to linkages and growing them. I already mentioned community development in this country, but there's lots of other things going on. Uh, Martin has a company in Irish which I can never pronounce. <laughs> Sorry, if it was in German, I couldn't pronounce. Um, which, the whole point of it is developing these circles of support around people. It's not a million miles. In fact, it's only a quarter of an inch away to tapping into that to begin augmenting people's decision-making capacity and so forth. So the Act has got to acknowledge these linkages, develop them, and tap into them uh, in some meaningful way. Um, and also, and this is an area that's really not well understood, in as much as there is a protection um, impulse remaining that's valid, and it is valid, okay? It's not written out and screened out. There's got to be better ways of achieving protection than taking people's voice away. And that really has to do with um, appropriate mainstreaming into adult, general adult protection mechanisms, which are not really well developed in this country. So that's a big challenge uh, on all sides. But it's not an answer to have a problem in protecting to actually remove somebody's voice. That's not an appropriate protective uh, measure. Um, task number seven, the Act should specify transitional arrangements if needed. Uh, Rome wasn't built in a day, but it was built, okay? Now, what I'm getting to there is that what if you still have some people in government who are not convinced about the paradigm shift? Or they say it's imprudent to make the jump now. Um, I wish we jumped together. Northern Ireland has ratified, we haven't ratified. <laughs> I'm embarrassed about that. Sorry, apologies. <laughs> um, what if it's premature or you know yourself, what if people are acting very conservatively within the system because problems may arise, and if problems arise, your career is affected, right? I mean, that's the way gatekeepers think in the system, and hey, you know, if you were there, that's probably the way you think too. So if transitional arrangements are needed whereby you, have, you move from plenary guardianship, which is wardship, to limited guardianship with some support tacked on, then what would you need to try and get that over the line in terms of satisfying her committee and in terms of injecting a positive dynamic of change, notwithstanding that you're going to live temporarily with limited guardianship? Well, I would say you need cutoffs, timelines, and milestones. You need to communicate clearly that this modus vivendi of limited guardianship is just that, a modus vivendi. You've got to commit to eroding it through time and perhaps even eliminating it over time. Um, no new entries should be allowed to guardianship and an automatic review for everybody um, uh, and then move them into a support regime. You also have to identify the triggers. Um, at what point, what kind of proofs do you need to satisfy yourself that it's now safe enough to dismantle completely 
the guardianship system, whether partial or total, and move completely to a support system. You've got to be upfront about that in the act itself. And then the notion of the doctrine of progressive achievement <coughs> kicks in. But that notion of progressive achievement has limiting principles. The government has not given um, maximum latitude to do what it likes. It's got to move in a particular direction with measurable achievement and the tools to measure that and so forth. Now, I'm not arguing for that kind of transition arrangement, but I'm just hypothesizing that if more conservative elements in government want to have it both ways, want to have the protection system in the form of guardianship with the support system, then there's got to be some real dynamic of change embedded in the bill to move you over time from one to the other. And hey, guess what? If we enact this without that triggering mechanism, you're stuck for the next 30 years, because that's the way politics works, and we all know it. Um, task number eight. There has to be, I think, a clear, purposeful, purposeful review mechanism. If you looked at the 2008 uh, bill, heads of bill, it said that this act will be reviewed in five years. Doesn't tell you by who, doesn't tell you who's involved, who has a right to be involved on the outside, doesn't tell you what they're looking for, uh, what their overall purpose is. So I think if there is to be a review mechanism, it's got to be darn clear about what it's looking for and collect the evidence in order to be able, at that point, to make uh, a knowledgeable judgment about whether we really move completely from one system to another. So you've got to reflect on what worked, what didn't, identify the critical success factors as the major inhibiting factors. In other words, you don't just announce the support system and let the loss lie where it falls, let it take its own course. You've got to be proactive in supporting that and, and harvesting the knowledge. And then at the appropriate moment, if not before, you decide to begin dismantling the more um, intrusive, protective regimes that might be let over, left over. There might be an interim review, I think that would be a very good idea. And then the question is who or how is it to be conducted? Um, and we have to ensure adequate civil society input. Now, what's, we've all seen self-referencing review processes in the past that lead to anodyne conclusions. That's not, not where it's at in terms of this, because the stakes are far, far too high. Um, i move on from that. Um, I think it's important that we do this not just because Theresa's committee wants it, but because it's actually built into our DNA. Now, some of the language around the foundation of the state is quite patronizing uh, when you read it closely, but the sentiment is a sentiment of equal citizenship. And in a way, what we're really doing is we're not honoring international law, we're really just retrieving legacy values in our own system and trying to be faithful. And it's no accident, 2016 is coming up, and we have a lot of reckoning to do because I think we've made a lot of mistakes over the last hundred years. So that's the update, that's the obstacle. Watch this space. It probably will be published before the end of July. I'm told that the door will probably be in recess by the end of July. Uh, and then people will really have to get their act together and find, figuring out for themselves what their red lines are and then interacting constructively with the Oireachtas, particularly the Justice Committee. And then, hopefully, we can ratify and issue our initial report to the committee. Thank you very much. Thank you, Joe. And just before handing over to John um, for concluding remarks, I want to say, first of all, there will be an evaluation sent out to you all by email. We would really welcome your, your comments and your feedback on the day. Um, so look out for that. Furthermore, the presentations and the information around the day, the notes of the day, will be available on both websites. That's the BFI website and the um, Centre for Disability and Law, Law, Policy and Law in, in UIG. Both those websites, um, the information will be available on. Night lunch we served up the corridor in about in, at one o'clock ish, depending on what time you decide to wrap up. So now. I just want to thank you all for coming and hand over to John here for his closing remarks. Thank you very much. I said I'd very quickly deal with the protest visibility question. I want to link it to some of the uh, things that Joe was saying. Every letter, every phone call, every conversation with the system, or the Oireachtas members, they're inherently a protest because it's all, you don't, you don't usually engage with them to 
Well, I'm to thank them to engage them to say, you must go further. Now, that's not a complete answer to that, but it's simply saying that everything we do when we engage with the system is saying <coughs> it must go further and it must go sooner. The visibility is a huge uh, aspect of this. I want to link that to the issue of our own, if you like, getting our own act together. It is very easy, I can tell you, to have a protest. I don't want to make little of protest, street protest or whatever, it's very easy to do it. But the impact has to be around how well organized you are, your views, your arguments, making your case, following up with people. So what are our red lines, as Jared said? Have we got our ambassadors? The, the local spread of it as well as an event that takes place in front of Parliament, alternative reporting, having good script, having good intelligence from across the movement, the organisation. These are the impacts of the changes you made to housing supports, to mobility supports, how it is affecting people. So it's calibrating the act to uh, the act that can be easily photographed of protest with what is behind it. That's the issue for us uh, in relation to it. Um, let, let me quickly move um, to concluding remarks. Gerard, the Centre for Disability Law and Policy, DFI, um, this is not the way of blowing our trumpet. We've put a good bit of effort into this. I think our instinct was right, uh, and I think uh, certainly there's no doubt the response of people here today has shown that we could have had people asking questions, solid questions, and engaging for, for much longer. I think, if you like, our commitment, our promise to you as to how we do it, and, and of course, the more the merrier to be involved, uh, we have to give support to folk to move this stuff on. And we will certainly be considering that. Maybe in your evaluations, that's maybe one of the things you want to, to uh, think about. Mark Nocton said, I can have the supports on an individual arrangement. I need to have them on an individual arrangement. And what I thought was, you go and buy a pair of shoes, their size, this, that, or the other but it's the imprint of your body and foot on them that makes them yours. And what we want is services and supports that you can see the signature of that person in them. They're built around and modified around that person. And that's very different from you take the next set of clothes when you come out of the shower. That's, if you like, in a graphic way, where we want to, to move from. I was cared for, but I'm not so sure that I was cared about. Someone said that this morning. Was it was it I didn't remember who said it. <laughs> but, look, there's so many things I could pick up on. I think, will you reflect on the bits that meant something to you this morning. And indeed, when you are, send it in your little piece. Don't do your, just don't tick box things. Rob was good, but this was that. It nearly kept on time except for me. But, you know, what concept, what sentence, what reflection uh, meant something to you? At the end of the day, human rights, for me, are about a sense that I'm treated with dignity and respect in all aspects of my life that I'm related to by people and dignified. They may not be saying things to me I like to hear, but there's dignity and respect in the relationship. And we have to bring that more in the way we relate with people, uh, more from thinking about service provision to being of service, how we are all of service to others in lots of ways. Look, I'll leave it at that. 
I should, in, in, in saying thanks, the only person I want to mention is myself. <laughs> <laughs> By way of saying, I did nothing, literally did nothing to make this happen. It was staff. 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 I, I did something to make it drag on. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I did nothing to make this happen. Uh, staff in DFI and Gerald and his staff. Uh, you owe them uh, thanks if you value this morning. You can express that to them now, and you can express it to them when you see them. But we have, as I said at the start, taken heart from the, the full attendance, and then during the engagement, people, you know, were on the button, the interest was there. Have your light lunch, talk to each other again. We have something here that we can spread and move. Uh, and we, that is our, if you like, our commitment uh, between the centre and ourselves and anybody else to, to do that. But Gerard, now is the time. Okay, thank you all very much. <laughs>